There we are. Can you hear me now? Hi. Yes, we can. Just let me just switch my speaker to a different device. You say something? Hello. Yes. Hello. That's better. Okay. Yeah. Yep. It picks up default system audio, so I have to switch that from my speakers to my headphones. Yeah. Yeah, I, I found this as well. Okay. Great. Thanks for uh, for joining the table. Let's kick things off. Um, so, I'm Alan Kanaba from Appiable. And we're here today to talk about how not to be a microservices pessimist. And uh, joining me on stage, I have uh, Thomas Schwensen and Jonathan Haywood. So hi, guys. Hi. Hi, hi. hi everyone. Hi. Uh, Thomas, maybe you could kick off by just saying a couple of words about yourself, introduce yourself. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Thomas Svensson, work as a solution architect within uh, Software AG, or part of the Nordic team, uh, work uh, out of Stockholm, but yeah, work with customers and prospects uh, in all Nordic countries, I would say. Jonathan? Right, yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Jonathan Haywood. I'm uh, based in the Netherlands, been with Software AG for uh, 17 years, worked in professional services and in product management, uh, and now I'm in the leadership team of the business unit uh, driving the strategy around our integration API and microservices products. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. So um, I'll just set the stage a little bit. So so we're here to talk about um, some of the microservices today. So microservices have been around for many, many years now. And especially in the beginning, they were touted as being a silver bullet to all your integration needs, right? So being more agile, more secure, more connected, uh, especially from a business perspective, um, very, very well liked. Uh, however, as we've, we're getting over this uh, hype curve now, um, a new type of pessimist has uh, been bred, and that's the uh, microservices pessimist uh, who has come along. And their perception is that you know things haven't gone as well. Uh, and, and we're here at this table today to talk about, okay, um, how is that versus the reality? Okay, what's the reality of the situation with microservices? And also about how we can implement microservices to address the business challenges uh, and from a business perspective, how we can get those in as well. So that's what we're here to talk about. I'll ask the audience, please, to um, please post some questions uh, in the chat there. We'll, we'll try and get to the questions. Uh, in the meantime, we had some questions uh, raised um, by the guys joining, so, so I'll, I'll start with those. So great, let's kick off then. So um, in some recent research by Vance and Bourne, they found that 90% of C-level executives found um, or said that they were using microservices. Whereas if you go down a level to, to mid-tier IT guys, uh, they said that only 68% of these guys said their company was using uh, microservices. Um, and you know, what do you think that difference shows? Well, I think, yeah, it's, it's quite an interesting one because you're asking essentially the same set of companies whether they use microservices. And apparently there is a reality gap there between sort of senior management that probably think they're using microservices or have told their IT guys to use microservices. But maybe in reality, uh, there's the realization there that microservices are difficult. Maybe they've tried something, maybe they've piloted something, but they don't really feel that it is there and that it is productive. Um, and you know, I think that that is also related to the, let's say the hype around microservices, the high sort of better expectations that senior management has, particularly of course, all of the, the, the sort of Poster child com uh, companies like uh, you know Netflix and Amazon and Google that have become big on on microservices, but have also um, been doing it for an awful lot longer than the average company. Um, I think that people are sort of underestimating the mindset change that is needed and the fact that you need to sort of go back and really take baby steps to work out where the value lies, rather than trying to do things across the board um, and sort of boil the ocean, I suppose. Right, but have you actually um, implemented any microservices, uh, and and how did they weigh up against your expectations, and, and did you have any like challenges uh, in building microservices? Well, I think that's be very interested to to hear those sort of things from the uh, from the audience, the people that are uh, that are that are part of this. Um, what we see, of course, is that very few organizations start from a greenfield. 
uh, there's always going to be a large basis of existing applications out there, whether they are standard packaged applications or they're custom applications that have been developed over the years. So of course you need to work out how to now leverage microservices within within that sort of environment. And what we see is that organizations will find, at least with our, with our customer base, will look for the right um, the right use case, one that fits, one where they can start to get a feeling for the 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 value of microservices, get a feeling for the technology around it. Um, but let's say without the the pressure of massive business success or failure, certainly on the the early project. So it's I think the, the key is finding the right places to 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 start with that and to become familiar with the technology and the changes in uh, organizational uh, requirements and so on. But I'd be interested to hear from the experiences of the other people in the audience as well. Right, yeah, please please post in, in the chat there. And uh, one of the biggest challenges if you're using microservices, how, how do you handle thousands of microservices when you have them? Well, I don't, uh, Thomas, will you sort of step in at some point? Um, I, again, it's, uh, it, it, it's about scale. And the I think that's what, uh, you know, the, the granularity of microservices is very important. People tend to think of them as being very small. And the best practice maybe is that these are very highly atomic uh, uh, services. Um, but in, in reality, people will still get some value out of uh, separation and what maybe some people call mini services, um, which uh, at least you're making steps away from the monolithic architectures of the past um, uh, and getting uh, separation of concerns. Um, but uh, um, uh, at least keeping things manageable in, uh, in that in that phase. And maybe so, Thomas. Yeah. yeah. So and maybe to add there as well is that of course that as you said, Jonathan, uh, getting thousands of microservices. Of course, that could be a challenge because the microservices will have dependence on each other, and if you have problem or getting problems, you need to have have possibilities to really figure out where is the problem. Where do I have the dependencies? Really get the monitoring, the traceability, uh, really to understand how the different things work together and really have the possibility to, when you get problem, to really figuring it out. So I really think that's a key thing uh, as well. I think one of the the things that we've we've also seen with that is that, that microservices are often uh, uh, Sort of, let's say technical building blocks and it's sometimes difficult when you're managing a landscape that to relate them to the business functions that they're supporting relate them to the apps they're supporting putting them in the context of the apps that they're uh, that they're supporting um and uh, you know for, for as, you, as you said thomas that the 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 dependencies there and what's the impact of, uh, of issues in a microservices landscape is people find that challenging to to manage Right, and you also end up with like microservice spaghetti, right? And uh, all the interdependencies <laughs> there, right? Uh, that's what I've seen as well. Um, but you know, how do you prevent that from becoming uh, too complex, right? You know, I, we've all seen these uh, implementations of microservices where it's just you know every developer is creating ten microservices a day. Uh, how do you prevent that from happening? Well, I think that's where obviously management platforms do come in, um, and uh, and of course there's uh, there's technologies like uh, like service mesh, of course, built, you know, are built around Kubernetes to to uh, to manage those things, uh, but often providing an, uh, this meta layer on top that can uh, that can provide application context and. Uh, in, in grouping, managing, and deploying microservices rather than at, uh, at a more deep technical level uh, can be valuable. And also, I would say uh, uh, another thing is maybe that I know that one of the analysts at Gartner typically asked the audience, uh, do you think governance is good? And of course, everyone really says that he, they like governance. But uh, if they, the next question is, do you like to be governed? And of course, most of the audiences are actually saying no. So, but but you really need to get a mix of that. You you can't really give everyone total freedom, total flexibility to really do whatever they they want to. You really need to make sure that people are working together. That they are following certain rules, guidelines, and things like that. 
Well, that's an excellent uh, point, uh, Thomas, because the um, of course the the promise of microservices, one of the, the the founding principles is that developers can choose their own implementation stack. So you are you're you're not uh, exercising governance at that level. You're giving them freedom to implement, but yet you've got to provide governance in the areas where it is is important. Uh, like security or like resource protection in these areas, and I think that that's that's you're you're right that the let's say the pessimists are worried about anarchy and, and complete free for all, um, and you get back to the days of uh, everybody writing point to point interfaces and things like that without any control. Uh, y yet you've got to find the balance between that and, uh, and and very strict governance where everybody has to follow the, the, the same guidelines. And I think that the, the microservices principles are definitely right. Um, but as people realize, you're never going to be able to follow it completely in the, the, uh, according to the textbook. Um, and the, the balance is finding the, the, the right way to navigate uh, amongst that. Yeah. What about, um, for example, Kubernetes as a microservices platform? Uh, how, how does that fit into this equation? Well, well, Kubernetes is is a orchestration framework for microservices, um, um, but it, in itself, it is a sort of fairly low low technical level. Um, it it provides the basis for being able to interact, but when it comes to uh, uh, things like the, the the registry and the orchestration of connectivity between it, that's when service mesh technology comes in. Uh, but the question is, is even service mesh technology um, uh, which which sits on Kubernetes is is even that sufficient to to provide the frameworks that are needed, or is it, or is there still more on top of that? In fact, that that does happen to be one of the areas that where um, some of the capabilities that Software AG provides uh, with with App Mesh really is the sort of let's say the next layer on top of uh, on top of Service Mesh to uh, to ensure really that developers can focus their time more on what the microservice is doing rather than a lot of sort of technical things around it because what you find is when you start using microservices because these frameworks are still let's say uh, relatively immature you'll spend an awful lot of time dealing with connectivity uh, registry security uh, getting app context and all of these type of things um, we provide that framework on top that allows you to focus more of the developer time on on actually where the business value is and what the business cares about. And in a way, it's it's a sort of a similar curve to what uh, may have happened in the past with, uh, you know, with an enterprise service bus or uh, those type of technologies 10, 15 years ago, where you want people to focus on the data mapping and not have to worry about knowing the protocol of every application that you're connecting to. Yeah, that reminds me of that. Uh, we had a question from the uh, audience coming in, uh, and they said, "Well, how many API services is too many?" <sighs> how long is a piece of string? <laughs> I think that's it. that's the thing. And if you, and in fact, if you if you think about, well, even without Microsoft, if you just think about managing anything at scale, um, with the right technology and the right frameworks, you can you can manage things at a much higher scale than you thought possible. I mean, if you asked many years ago, how big is a data, how, when does a database get too big or when does a, a file get too big, you keep pushing the boundaries on that. Um, and I certainly think that that uh, as technology matures, you will be able to manage larger landscapes of uh, microservices with a same size team without chaos ensuing. Um, but uh, yes, it is at a different point to the maturity curve, and I think that it's, it's quite clear that 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 research by Vance and Bourne um, that I think also looked at um, the challenges associated with uh, um, that people see with implementing microservices that uh, just maturity, but also the skill set um, are also seen as significant barriers. So it's not just uh, it's it's not just a Technological thing, but people also realizing that the that there's maybe a different skill set uh, required as well. Right. No, so, same question to Thomas. Then, uh, how many API services are too many? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably the same type of answer as Jonathan. I, I can't really say. 
and it's definitely as Jonathan is saying, uh, I remember working with databases in the 90s and you talked about megabytes of data. So that's the maximum today. You're really, really having many, many terabytes of data and it still works. So, but right now, no, I definitely see as Jonathan says that it is a challenge because the tools that we have, Kubernetes uh, service mesh tools and things like that, typically are rather technical. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, then can keep things running, but doesn't really solve the complexity. Right. I, I guess it depends upon the uh, the actual domain who's in charge of those microservices, right? You know, they they, they create enough to you know get the job done uh, and the things that that they uh, uh, need to do. So uh, another question to to the audience then. Basically, if if you have any more um, questions, please please feel free to to step and ask some questions now. Um, again, uh, we're interested. Okay, if your company has implemented uh, any microservices. Uh, especially in what your challenges were. So feel free to, to ask any questions um, on that. Um, but, but maybe you guys could tell us a little bit more about the um, products that Software AG has that can help in this this domain. I mean, what would you actually have out of the box? Well, yeah, we, we tend to see uh, APIs, integration and microservices really as being very, very tightly linked. And you know, I, I can tell you why. Obviously, microservices are for building new business capabilities. If you're familiar with the model from Gartner, the Gartner pace layering, where they talk about systems of record, systems of differentiation, and systems of innovation, right? So clearly, systems of record, those tend to be standard applications, highly governed, don't change very frequently. They're your ERP system, your warehouse management system, and so on. But you're not going to beat your competition by implementing SAP or something like that, right? Because everybody has it. So when you're developing differentiating capabilities or innovative capabilities, by definition, they're sort of custom developed. And in the past, you did that with a monolithic application. Now you're doing it with microservices to be more flexible, faster, quicker, and all of these types of things. But if you have a look at a microservice, again, the textbook definition is that it has to encapsulate its own data and be completely sort of self-contained. But I think yeah. in reality, an awful lot of the data exposed by microservices is actually resides in some of your systems of record. And maybe it's the way that you expose them or, or the way that you process them, the way that you transform that, uh, that, that is now, this, let's say, the microservice part. So um, the chances that a microservice is truly going to be completely self-contained are, are relatively slim. Um, and therefore, the need for integration behind that uh, can also be quite uh, quite real. Um, similarly, of course, uh, uh, API management is that that uh, microservices expose APIs, but you also have APIs exposed by your standard applications or that you may be consuming from standard applications or from third parties. So it all becomes part of the same ecosystem. Um, and really, that's the way you know we approach it, that you know, providing capabilities for creating microservices, especially when those are encapsulating uh, enterprise data in in cloud or on-premise applications or databases, the API management capabilities, but then also putting those API management capabilities directly on the boundaries of microservices in sidecars uh, with uh, an overall management layer around that. Um, and of course, all of that, regardless of whether it's on-premises or in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how we we view that 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 ecosystem. And uh, right. Um, uh, we don't see organizations going all out for microservices. They're using them in very targeted areas. Um, right. But of course, you have an incumbent landscape, which is, in many cases, is fit for purpose as is. Um, and you're using microservices in very specific areas. Mm -hmm. So we, I alluded at the start, you know, that, you know, microservices have a little bit gone through this like hype cycle now. Um, where, where do you where do you see them fitting at this point in time on that hype cycle? Do you think we've we've now gone over the hype and we're, you know, into the trough of disillusionment? Or where are we? <laughs> I think it's still heading down into the trough of disillusionment. Uh, um, uh, I think it is maybe just over the hype and uh, and certainly this discrepancy between that we talked about earlier, where C levels say ninety percent. 90% of C levels say there are organizations using it, whereas 68% of others. I think the the, the mid-level managers are already fearing, fe feeling that uh, let's say the, the the pain of the 
the, the trough of disillusionment. That's, um, I think, definitely, definitely quite evident. But if you see, in a way, the the hype cycles and how quickly things move in that area, I think that 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 it'll probably come out of it maybe faster than uh, than some other technology. Right, right. I see a lot of promise in the, uh, you know, the air space of microservices. It maybe it hasn't quite met there yet, but I think we're definitely over the next year is going to see microservices make a little bit of a, a rebound, and uh, definitely those organisations that that understand them will 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 definitely uh, be, be in a good place. But like you said, I don't think it's for like every single part of the organization needs to be broken up into to microservices. Um, in fact, I mean, I don't know if you've ever seen this. Have you ever seen any instances where microservices would power like an API product? Because um, I mean, I, I, I'm an API product manager, so it's a very you know uh, selfish question, but um, have you seen that kind of in action at any of your customers? Yes, I mean, there's. I think there's there's a very good example of that. Uh, uh, one of our customers is BTPN Bank in um, uh, in Indonesia, which um, you can imagine Indonesia is a is a very highly distributed country, lots of islands, very lots of rural areas. So access to banking services was a big challenge for a lot of people there. They um, have. have uh, implemented microservices over the last few years in sort of two phases. First of all, they uh, enabled uh, local agents, which may be just a little corner shop in a village, to be able to offer um, banking services uh, directly to uh, to people. Uh, and then later, um, more the sort of self-service uh, directly through through mobile apps. All of that was was backed by microservices. Obviously, as you say, it's it's ultimately API driven, but they were using microservices to to power those APIs, uh, and that helped them to reach a completely new market. I think they onboarded uh, eighty five thousand new, uh, literally new customers within the space of three months after they they launched that platform. And yeah, I think that that's the type of thing if they're if they're working in that way. And obviously, behind that, there's going to be some very rigid banking systems because ultimately that's that's what's behind it but by taking that microservices approach they were able to very rapidly adapt to that to that market and uh, provide these these new services yeah. yeah that's that's a great uh, great success story I, I hadn't heard that one before i'll definitely uh, have a look at it so we're we're coming up to to time now so um uh, if you guys have any you know closing uh, thoughts um else we can uh, end it there well, I think one thing uh, I'd like to, to 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 recommend. You've heard us talk about about pessimists, and we 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 recognise this sort of uh, uh, perception difference between uh, between senior management and uh, maybe the re the realists in the IT department that that know how difficult it is. Um, we've actually published a, a, a guide which we call the Pessimists Guide to Microservices, which can actually help you sort of find that middle ground and and where the value really can be had uh, between the the hyped optimists and maybe you the pessimist that sort of thinks well it's not that simple but how am i going to tell them um look up pessimist guide to microservices um share it with your friends it may make your life a little bit easier yeah there we go uh, and ella is saying that you can find it in the uh, in the booth as well so if you go to the software archi booth then you can find that that guide there so it's a good hint uh so we're going to take a short break now um and, and we'll be back in um uh, when we will be back at uh, 4 p.m um here for the next round table uh thomas and jonathan thank you very much uh that was very interesting and uh yep goodbye thanks Al. thanks everyone thank you thanks. bye bye, bye, -bye. Bye.